I'm Ian Dilley. And I am Michael Sheehan. Today we have got a Volta Estania update. We are entering the third and final week of this year's Volta. And we're going to go over some of the events that are coming up on Flow Bikes. Of course, GP, Quebec, and Montreal. The World Tour races in Canada, which serve as the final tune-up for the World Championships, um, which of course will be live and on demand on Flow Bikes for viewers in Canada. GP, Quebec, and Montreal will be available to viewers in the U.S. And we also have the start of the Cyclocross World Cups, which will be available to viewers in Canada. Iowa City starts this weekend on Saturday. Let's get into this Vuelta. Yeah, first and foremost, we have to talk about some Americans, and we're going to start off with a Texan, Lawson Craddock, who has just been on a roll in the middle of this year's Vuelta Espana, really picking up the pieces from a pretty shattered EF education first. They saw a lot of their stars uh, get caught up in a crash, had to go home. Lawson Craddock did not skip any beats. He's had three top ten finishes in the past few days. Yeah, he was fourth in the stage ten individual time trial, only 48 seconds off of race winner Primoz Roglic. The next day he went on to finish a uh, third, a, a disappointing third for him, actually. He really felt like he could win this mid-mountain day in the Basque Country. And then I think the ride that truly impressed me was the um, stage 15 day in the mountains. He finished seventh, um, finishing just in head of Primoz Roglic and Alejandro Valverde um, from the breakaway. So yeah, incredible riding by Lawson Craddock. He was just announced to the U.S. Uh, national team for the World Championships and a very deserving uh, selection. He joins Chad Haga, fellow Texan, as long as Nielsen Paulus and Alex Howes. It's going to be an exciting world's team, and obviously Lawson is on great form. Yeah, and I think that time trial from the Volta really cemented that start, uh, starting spot in Yorkshire for Lawson. Let's get into stage 15, though. This day that Lawson rolled the break and got seventh, it was won by an, an, another American, the climbing sensation Sepp Kuss, who is still seems to be pretty new to the world tour he's only been there for maybe two years i think it doesn't seem like that long ago when i saw him just come out of, uh at the redland cycling classic in california and went up oak Glen. that was in 2016 so he has had just a pretty staggering progression through the uh, road cycling sport and just got a grand tour win yeah, keep in mind that Seb Kuss is only 24 years old and, yeah, relatively inexperienced on the road. He came up as a mountain biker, uh, former collegiate national champion on the mountain biker for UC Boulder, and he came up through the Durango Devo program, um, which is a program that's just known for developing world-class mountain bikers in, you know, one of the capitals of mountain biking in the U.S. And I think the most impressive thing about Sepp's ride was, you know, who it was over, who he dropped. You know, Teo Gegenhart on Ineos, who is another incredible rider. And then holding off Valverde and Roglic, who are chasing hard behind. I mean, this is exciting for me because this is the first pure climber from the U.S. that we've had really in a generation. I mean, Sepp is a guy that can climb and outclimb the very best riders in the world. And, you know, he just signed for three more years with Yumbo Visma. He's going to be supporting Tom Dulin and Steven Kreuzvik and Primoz Groglic during that time. But afterwards, I would love to see him leading an American team like EF or Trek and being a GC contender for himself. I mean, he is going to have to get much much better at time trialing. If you look at his individual time trialing results, they are pretty sad. A lot of places in the 70th, uh, 90th, and 100th, but it's also something that he's never really had to focus on because he's um, two years in the world tour, has just been focused on going up mountains quickly. But I think that role, that evolution is going to change for him if he keeps producing results like he has been at this Welta. Yeah, and with this being his third Grand Tour in just two years at the world tour level he's clearly got a knack for this long uh, style of racing and i would love to see him continue to progress and i think that's a great take uh, maybe we'll see him leading an american team to uh, gc succession at some point he definitely has the chops in the mountains let's get into who is winning the volta Espana right now sub teammate primos roglic we are going into the final week of the volta Espana, and the question is can he hold it my take is that this final week is about as good and as friendly to Primoz Roglic as he could possibly hope. There are only two mountain days left. 
<laughs> yeah, and but these are hard mountain days, and I don't think the fact that there are only two mountain days in this final week necessarily makes this final week less hard. Um, let's look at the stage on Thursday. This is almost an exact replica of the stage in 2017, where Fawu Arus took the win away from Tom Dumoulin. Of course, Dumoulin was only holding a tenuous six-second lead over Aru heading into that stage, but he did end up losing over three minutes on the day. So if Roglic is on an off day on one of these um, big days in the mountains, his lead could come crumbling away. He only has two minutes and 48 seconds on Alejandro Valverde, and he has about four minutes on Tadej Pogacar and uh, Miguel Angel Lopez. But as we saw in the past, Astana can set a furious pace on these climbs. And I don't think this Balto is over, but it does look like Roglic is going to get Yumbo Visma's first Grand Tour victory, uh, which would be huge for this team. It does look like it. Thursday, that is four category one mountain passes across about 178 kilometers. For my money, though, uh, it is the penultimate stage, stage 20 of the Volta Espana, that Primoz Roglic is going to be the most scared about. There are six categorized climbs, and it is the final mountaintop finish of the Volta. They finish atop a category three climb. There pretty much is not a single stretch of flat road in this entire stage, and if a team like Astana or Movistar is going to plan a raid and leave all their cards on the table, I think that Saturday is the day for them to do it. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting finale. Of course, tune in live or on demand if you are a viewer in Canada. And if you're in the U.S., we have tons of wealth of comment, um, content, interviews, uh, features. Definitely check out the site, uh, tune in to the app. Lots of coverage from the Vuelta um, for U.S. cycling fans. So let's get into this weekend, GP Quebec and Montreal. These, of course, are two um, hilly one-day classics on circuits, exciting races, and very similar to what we're going to see on the finishing circuit at the World Championships in Harrogate. Yeah, the uh, 2018 editions of both Quebec and Montreal were won by Michael Matthews. He is returning, and there is an all-star lineup of riders who are going to be here. A lot of riders have picked these as their final tune-up races for the Yorkshire World Championships because the circuit is so similar. We're going to be seeing Peter Sagan, Remco of Venepool, Greg Van Avermaet, Michael Woods, Vincenzo Nibali. Grant, Grant Thomas, Mikhail Kwiatkowski. It is, yeah, it is truly a stacked field and it's going to be exciting, aggressive racing. Yeah, do you have a favorite? I do, I have a favorite and I have a dark horse. I'm going to go with Michael Matthews for the win. I mean, if you watch the way he dominated these finishes uh, last year, it was incredibly impressive. Of course, um, he did have a very strong team behind him in those races, helping keep things together for a field sprint. Chad Haga um, played a really important role in bringing those races down to field sprints. I don't think he has quite the team he had last year, um, but he is certainly motivated. He didn't have the Tour de France that he quite wanted. He went to the Tour um, expecting to help Tom Dumoulin. Dumoulin ended up not doing the Tour due to injury and I feel like Matthews kind of struggled throughout the Tour de France. I think he is very motivated for um, these final tune-up races for the World Championships and the World Championships. He was left off the Australian team last year for the World Championships, something he was not happy about and I believe he is definitely going to be the leader for this year's uh, World Championships. So I don't see anybody beating uh, Michael Matthews but give me your favorite and then I'll, I'll let you know if someone does beat him who it might be. Okay. My favorite is former world champion Peter Sagan. We have only seen him once since the Tour de France when he won the green jersey. It was at the Cyclassics Hamburg race. He got sixth place, uh, was just edged out in a really intense field sprint by a bunch of the quick sprinter types, Elia Viviani won. But I think that is a good sign for Peter Sagan, who has had a pretty rocky year by his standards. He has not had the abundance of success that he's used to. But you just have to think, he must be dreaming about Yorkshire and putting on a fourth world championship jersey. Uh, and if he's going to have the form to do it, we're going to see it this coming weekend in Canada. Yeah, this World Championships really reminds me for Peter Sagan a little bit of his first World Championships in Richmond, where he had a bit of a rough spring by his standards, did not win one of the monuments, uh, but came back at the end of the year and won Worlds, and I think he is probably uh, treating this season very similarly. Uh, my dark horse for this race is EF Sepp Van Mark. This is another rider who didn't have the spring he wanted, ended 
ended up in a ditch hurting his knee at E3 Haarobeke. Um, still had a solid ride at the Tour of Flanders, but um, you know, for him, somebody who's regularly on the podium at the Classics, it was a bit of a disappointment. He has shown incredible late season form, uh, recently had a stunning victory at the Britannia Classic, uh, followed all the moves to perfection, and then had an attack about 1K to go to solo in for the victory. Um, Sepp is on great form, and these races are races for the opportunists. I mean, let's take, for example, Rigoberto Iran won GB Quebec back in 2015. So a solo rider can get away and steal the glory from the sprinters in these races. That they can. My dark horse, who could also steal some glory from the sprinters, is the young Belgian Remco Evenepoel. He is going to be uh, in Canada with a really, really strong Dakota Quick Step team. On that team is also Julian Alphilippe, as well as the kind of sensation of their year, Casper Asgreen. Remco Evenepoel will likely be working for Julian Alphilippe, but what we saw at Classica San Sebastian, Remco Evenepoel knows how to take a chance and knows how to make it stick. I don't think that anyone's going to pull him back if he manages to weasel his way off the front towards the end of these circuits. and. This is another uh, rider who I'm really excited to see what their form is leading into Yorkshire because we could see some surprises from the young Belgian in Yorkshire as well. Yeah, and if we're talking about Worlds, so we must be also talking about the start of cyclocross season. Of course, the UCI World Cup kicks off here in the U.S. at Iowa City. This was a race last year won by Katie Keogh on an incredible ride on a muddy day. Keogh known for her uh, handling prowess and power in the mud. Um, a big win by a U.S. woman at a World Cup. Um, this year, uh, I think Katie Keogh is going to come in this race on great form. Um, we, the other U.S. women are not looking as solid. Uh, Katie Compton often struggles in the early season. For some reason, she has recently injured her arm and won't be lining up at the U.S. World Cups. Ellen Noble did not have strong results um, recently at Rochester, but Canadian Magalie Rochette is looking good. Yeah, the Pan American uh, champion Magalie Rochette won both days at Rochester, and the World Cups are high on her t uh, target list especially the ones in North America, what the Europeans coming over for these races will do to those chances in both the men and women's field. Uh, we'll find out this weekend. Please do tune in and watch the cyclocross action. Yeah, we will have live coverage and on-demand coverage for viewers in Canada of the World Cups. Thanks for watching.